in the long run, there can be no joy for anybody until there is joy finally for us all. When large numbers of people share their joy in common, the happiness of each is greater because each adds fuel to the other's flame. Joy is prayer. Joy is strength. Joy is love. Joy is a net of love that draws people in. Joy is the simplest form of gratitude. The best way to show our gratitude to God and the people is to accept everything with joy. A joyful heart is the inevitable result of a heart burning with love. Never let anything so fill you with sorrow as to make you forget the joy of the Christ risen. Hey, good morning. My name is Josh Flores Olvera. Uh, I am the missions minister uh, here at First Temple, so if I have not met you, I'd love to meet you afterwards. Uh, Evan was supposed to be sharing with us today, but he said he had better things to do. Uh, and that's a good thing because him and Brittany welcomed uh, babies, and I, I said that correctly, ease. Uh, they, they welcomed multiple twins, uh, and that happened Tuesday, and they are doing great. Mom is doing great, and so they say hello, uh, and so we're happy and thankful for that. So, uh, Welcome to all of you who are joining us online. Uh, thanks for tuning in today, and uh, I hope that you're w able to join us soon, uh, as soon as you are able to, but if not, we're thankful that you're here with us anyways. So, um, If you've been at our church for any amount of time now, you know that every year in July, we take a mission trip to... Uh, the New Hampshire and Vermont area. And so we have some partners up there that we support, and uh, there's a ministry that's been going on over there that has just, man, like when you, when you do the Lord's work over that amount of time, it's just, it's, it's really cool. And so uh, on our way back this year, though, um, we were supposed to fly out uh, on a Saturday afternoon, and we get there, we go past security, and we've been there maybe 30 minutes or so, and we get told that our flight has been delayed. And so we wait, and that's not bad, and we get told our flight is delayed a second time, and when we get told a second time that the flight is delayed, uh, I get a text message that says, uh, your flight has been canceled. So we uh, get in line, and we realize pretty quickly that if our group stays together, there's seven of us, seven of us trying to catch a flight. If the seven, seven of us stick together, we can't fly back until Monday morning. Remember, this is Saturday afternoon. So we decide to split up. I split from the group. And we uh, get flights scheduled for that following morning around 5 a.m. The other team, or the other half of the team, has to travel to Boston, right? I'm in Manchester, New Hampshire. They have to travel to Boston. So I begin to look up hotels uh, to find a place to sleep that night, and I call seven different hotels, and seven different hotels are fully booked because NASCAR is in town. So I realize that I need to spend the night at the airport, and so I make this room. And by the way, when you have to spend the night at the airport, they don't turn off the lights for you. And so uh, I, I make a little bed for myself, and 30 minutes into my, uh, my sleep, I get woken up by a man who wants to know if he can use my charger. I can't fall asleep after that, and then at 4 in the morning, I get a text message saying, your flight has been canceled. So my, my flight was originally supposed to go from Manchester, Baltimore, to Austin, and now, uh, thankfully, I get one rescheduled, but now I'm going Manchester, Chicago, St. Louis, to Austin. Well, my flight gets delayed a second time, and after traveling halfway around the country like Miley Cyrus, I finally land in Austin, and I wait for an hour on a little carousel thing for my luggage. And it turns out, of all things, my luggage was in Tennessee. Have you ever had one of those days where it's just so hard you just want to go home and crawl into bed and just sleep? Well, you know, as much as this is like a first world problem, uh, we're going to be in the book of Philippians today, and, and we're going to look at the Apostle Paul's, uh, let's just say, the season that he's currently in. 
And what I went through is, is really a first world problem uh, in comparison to what the Apostle Paul has gone through. But uh, we, we just began this series on joy last week. Our lead pastor, Joe Lachlan, started us off uh, by encouraging us uh, to, to find joy in the work of God. And he, he also encouraged us to not lose hope, to not give up on the people around us. And I do want to reiterate that we were, what we were not doing was encouraging you to stay in oppressive or abusive relationships, but more what we were talking about was uh, to, you know, not give up on those people who get on your nerves, those people who just don't rub you the right way, who might vote or think completely differently from you. And the truth is, is that if we were alive during this time, this uh, this time of uh, when, when these letters are being written, before Paul became a Christian, the truth is, is that you and I probably would have given up on him. He went from being a, a really radical kind of murderer to, to being the great, one of the greatest Christians to ever walk the face of the planet because he had this real encounter with Jesus that just completely changed his life. And so today we're going to see that Paul wasn't just having like a hard couple days. You could say that like the last decade or so had been pretty challenging, and, and you might feel that way. For you, the pandemic uh, wasn't when the challenges began. For many of you, you have been going through a rough season even before that, and the pandemic just made it worse. And for some of us, the seasons have ended. For some of us, we are still in those seasons. I think this morning, the Apostle Paul has some things to tell us while we are in there, or as we are about to. Because the challenges we face are an opportunity to make God known and to choose joy. And I think we will see that here. So turn in your Bibles or look on the screen behind me. We are in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. And so follow along with me, if you will. He says, I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers and sisters, having been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, dare to speak the word with greater boldness and without fear. So I want us to look at two phrases there in these two verses. The first one is found in verse 12. He says, I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped so when I read that phrase, to me, what that tells me is that there was a point in which Paul had no idea why this was happening. You know, for, for you and me, many of us, like, we've gone through those seasons, right, where we don't know, why is God allowing this? As Paul mentions here, what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel. And then in verse 14, if you go down there, it says, and most of the brothers and sisters Having been made confident, having been made confident, which means at one point they were what? Not confident. There was a point for, for the brothers and sisters that Paul encourages in which they were afraid. And something happened in Paul's circumstances that changed that for them. They went from hiding to, to being out on the streets proclaiming Jesus. They went from uh, being quiet to all of a sudden not being able to be silenced. And all of that happened because of Paul's circumstances. And so Paul moves on in, in, in verse 18, the, the second half of that verse, he says, So I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus, Christ will turn out for my deliverance. And then go to, down to verse uh, 21. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. It means if I stay alive, I get to keep doing what I love. And I do not know which I prefer. Because I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to be with Christ, to depart. If I die, I get to go be with him. But if I stay, that is far better. Or, uh, but, it, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. So if you're a note-taker, here's, here's the first thing that we see in this uh, portion of Scripture, is that we are not our own, therefore we are not on our own. 
right? Because there's something uncomfortable about verse uh, 12 through 14, and it should make us uncomfortable because it's the opposite message that we constantly get communicated uh, in our culture. Paul is in prison because he is unwilling to stop speaking about Christ. And so the Roman government's response then has been to put him in uh, prison because they figured if we, can, if we can put him in this dungeon, it'll stop. Well, it's had the opposite effect. It's made it spread faster. And so my struggle, and, 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 and so I'm sure you're not, I'm, I'm not alone. My struggle is, is that when I'm going through challenges, what I really wish would happen is that I wish that, like, my home would be in order, that, you know, my body wouldn't have the things wrong with it that it has, or that I'd, I'd, I'd live in uh, a, a better neighborhood. Like, I, I wish that things were just going up and to the right the more I followed God. Paul's attitude is actually the opposite. He recognizes that the gospel wouldn't have spread as quickly had it not been for his circumstances. And rather than asking God to change them, he chooses joy. Have you ever seen the movie Finding Nemo? If you haven't, you are dismissed. Go and uh, watch Finding Nemo uh, because it is worth your time. But there is a uh, scene, right? Uh, you know the premise. This tiny little fish uh, tries to show how grown he is, and so he goes out into the middle of the ocean, gets captured, and his dad chases after him, crosses the whole Pacific going after Nemo. And there's this one scene where Marlin, the dad, is riding on the back of this turtle, and he's telling his story to a bunch of little turtles and Dory, the, the blue little forgetful fish. Right, And so what happens is he tells them, like, man, this is what happened to Nemo, and because of that, this has been my journey. This is what I've done for my son. And so Marlon tells his story to these turtles. And then these turtles tell a tuna fish. The tuna fish tells a tropical fish who tells a lobster, who tells a swordfish, who tells a dolphin, who tells a pelican, who tells Nemo what, what his father has done for him. And in the same way that Nemo would not have heard of his dad's love and pursuit of him had it not been for his circumstances. Right, because we all knew Marlon loved him before he got captured, but there was something about the, his circumstances that opened up his heart to hear how much his father loved him. And in the same way for us, friends, in our circumstances, there's this opportunity for people to see the Father's love and pursuit of us, that people might not have been open to, that our own hearts might not have been open to had we not been in those circumstances. Because in our circumstances, we have, for some reason, are more, we are more willing to open our hearts to God when we are in challenging circumstances. You know, and, and it may be hard to swallow, but there's a reason why choosing to follow Christ begins by choosing to lay our lives down, meaning that first, we choose to say, it is no longer about me. And then what that does, it's, when it's no longer about you, what that does, it's, it opens up the door for God to work and for, for us to have access to that joy. For the Christian person, especially the discouraged Christian person, joy is our nourishment. As it says in the book of Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so as we continue looking with Paul, we see that no circumstances or challenges are wasted with God. And so I want you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians with me. Uh, 2 Corinthians, by best estimates, was, was written about five to ten years uh, before the book of Philippians where we are currently in. And so let's look at like what's been going on with Paul. Let's, let's see what he's been up to. We're going to be in chapter 11, verses 24 through 28. And so this is what's, what's been up. Five times I have received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. So five times he's been whipped 39 times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning, that means he had huge rocks thrown at him. Three times I was shipwrecked, so like the movie Titanic, three times. For a night and a day, I was adrift at sea like castaway, but without the volleyball. 
on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers and sisters, and toil and hardship through many a sleepless nights, not in an airport. Hungry and thirsty, often without food, cold and naked, and besides other things, I am under daily pressure because of my anxiety for all the churches. So you look at this and you, you see physical issues, you see um, circumstantial issues, you see mental health issues going on with Paul five to ten years before Philippians. I mean, talk about a rough season, right? Like, especially those of us who have gone to college, like we know like that one semester, right? That's that semester. For Paul, it's been almost a decade. And we would have hoped that coming out of these challenges that we see here in 2 Corinthians, that God would have like, man, now, dude, you, that was enough. Like, I'm going to put you in a safe neighborhood. You know what? Here's a salary. Now you don't have to wonder where your food is going to come from. You know what? Let, let's put you in a church with all the bells and whistles and has it all together so that you don't have to be anxious about them anymore. And I'll be honest, like, my first inclination is not to choose joy. I think... If I had been Paul, I would have been a little bitter or maybe asked God to like, change my circumstances. I might even have toned down how much I talk about Jesus so that people stop coming after me. So that people stop making fun of me. But instead, Paul says in Philippians 1, 18, he says, I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. But see, my, my goal is not to make you feel guilty or bad and say, hey, look how bad Paul had it. Like, get over it. Like, that is not my heart at all. Instead, my goal is to point to Paul's life so that we can see Jesus. Because how incredible must life with Jesus be for all of that to be worth it? Paul's relationship with Jesus was such that Jesus was worth it. And when I read this text, I'm convicted because when I can't find joy in the midst of my suffering, I wonder, am I even looking to Christ? And if I am, and it's not enough, maybe there's something wrong with my version of Jesus. Maybe my Jesus is too small. So I'm not saying I shouldn't feel pain or the reality of the, of the challenges. I'm saying that when we experience pain and challenges, it's an opportunity to encounter joy. And that can only be found in God. After all, the Holy Spirit is our comforter. And why would you need a comforter if you're already comfortable? My uh, youngest sister um, was born when I was in sixth grade, so she, she's about 12 years younger than me. And when she was about the age of two, there was one of those nights where she just kept crying. Right? And we tried everything. We tried toys. We tried changing her diaper. We... Uh, you know, I'd give her some milk, she'd still be crying, and uh, that wasn't, it. oh, okay, it must be apple juice, you know. And so uh, it got to the point, though, where she had been crying long enough to where we realized this was pretty serious, so we took her to the uh, hospital. Well, they took her into surgery because her uh, appendix had burst, you know, as a two-year-old. And so we, we slept in the, in the hospital a couple of days. Our family got really close uh, during that time for Jackie, and... Uh, a couple of days later, uh, two or three, uh, I came to the hospital after school one day, and I saw uh, this. So here I am, this like wannabe jock 14-year-old who was the quarterback of his middle school football team, and so he thought he was all that. And there was something about this look that like completely softened my heart towards her. To the point where like, I, I asked her, I was like, what do, you, what do you want to do? She wanted me to play dolls with her. So here's this kid who thinks he's all that at the side of his little sister's bed playing dolls. And I'm really good at the tea party stuff. There's something about her suffering that softened my heart towards her to get me to be with her in a way that I probably wouldn't have done had she not been suffering. In the midst of our suffering, we open our hearts to God in a way where we encounter him in a way that we wouldn't have encountered him 
had we, had we not opened up our hearts because of the circumstances. Now, if me, being a snobby little teenager, would be able to do that for his little sister, how much more would a perfect father do that for us as we suffer? God does not waste our circumstances or our suffering. They may not always start out as good, but they always, for those who love them, work together for good. So here's the last thing that we can see here with Paul. When we choose joy, selflessness, and love are the natural byproducts. Look at verse 21 through 24 with me in uh, Philippians 1. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, right? So if I'm going to stay alive, I get to do what I love. And I do not know which I prefer. I'm hard-pressed between the two because my desire is to be with Jesus. He's the one that I've been doing this for. I could, I could be with him. And that, would, that would be what I ultimately want. But if I were to stay here, that's more necessary for you. Look how selfless that is. Paul's showing us how much he loves the Philippians. It would be to, to his advantage to die and be with Jesus, the one who he's been doing all this for, but he's, he's, he's willing to consider staying, even though his, his circumstances are horrible. When we choose joy in the midst of our circumstances, we can't help but produce selflessness and love. So my question to you is, during this pandemic season, what have we produced? It's been hard on all of us. What have we, what have you, what have I produced? Uh, two months into uh, Haley and I being married, I found out that one of uh, my, I don't know if I would call her friend, I would call her more of a mentor uh, from San Antonio, uh, her husband had died and, and I, I wasn't able to make the memorial. And so uh, Haley and I made plans uh, to, to go visit her and uh, the conversation there, and even when we were outside her house, was something like, man, how can we bless her? Like, she took me in when I, when I knew nobody in San Antonio, and um, it was just, I, I don't want to leave this place without her knowing how, how valuable she is. And, all, you know, th- that was kind of my desire. So we, we were in the car out, outside of her house, and uh, we, we pray, like, God, use us, help us have the right words, help us encourage her, help us love on her well. Like, we... we she needs it. So we spent close to an hour with her, and man, she, she began to tell me how to love Haley well based on her husband's example. She t- began to tell, give us marital advice, uh, and, and, and she, she even said, you know what, let me pray for your marriage. You guys are two months in. Let me just pray for you. And, and for an hour, she encouraged us. Here we were thinking that we were going to go and bless her. And in the midst of her suffering, she couldn't help but joyfully encourage us. Haley and I got back in the car, and I just, I remember thinking, well, that's not what I expected. In the midst of our circumstances, as painful as they may be, joy is available to us. And when we choose it, it's not that we pretend that we have it all together. It's not that we pretend that we don't need others. But it's that Christ meets us there. And and the natural overflow of that, the natural consequence of that is that we can't help but be selfless and love others. And there is joy in that. We cried together. She teared up as she told me stories about her husband. But you know what? We were encouraged. Do you want people to notice the Jesus who changed your life? For those of you, whether you're at home or here sitting, like for those of you who have decided to follow Jesus, you know Jesus changed your life. That trajectory was redirected. I I guarantee you, choose joy in the midst of your suffering. It's going to make people want to say, how? 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 There was something cool that came about 
from my, my USA tour coming back from Vermont. Uh, I got a voucher out of it. And uh, this is actually my first time ever submitting a complaint, right? So that felt weird. But I got a voucher out of it. And it wasn't necessarily like the monetary value of uh, the voucher that made it all worth it. It was actually what the voucher gave me the opportunity to do. Uh, yesterday, I, I got back from Los Angeles where I was able to spend some time with a friend who's been going through his own challenges. And because of what I went through of 30 minutes of sleep in 24 hours, halfway around the United States, canceled flights, delayed flights, it gave me this opportunity to be with him. And had I not gone through that, I would have not had the opportunity to do that. And the truth is, I got lucky this time. I got lucky that I got my reward immediately. Because for many of us, going, uh, suffering and our circumstances don't always provide a reward right away. You don't always see the reason why. You don't always see the benefit right away. But whether it's a year down the road, whether it's a voucher, whether it's a decade or at the end of your life, we can look back and see that the Lord was worth it. So my prayer for you is that whenever you see it, when you see that opportunity, my prayer for you is that you would not only see it, but seize it. Take advantage of it. So friends, you are called to choose joy and challenges as well. Yes, your pain is real. Yes, your challenges are real. But the beauty of serving our God is that even in pain, we have the opportunity to choose joy, and that joy is contagious. And so if you are currently going through some challenges, here is something that I want to say to you. Can you identify a, a way to find joy in this? If not, ask God to help you. Because all of us have heard this phrase, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reveal some of my theological cards here. It says, God will never give you more than you can handle. Personally, I think that's a lie. Scripture says God would never let us be tempted more than we can handle. But I think sometimes we are in situations that are more than we can handle, and we have no choice but to rely on God. It's in those circumstances that we find him and that option for joy. And lastly, for those of you who don't currently find yourself in those circumstances, what are you hoping for? Are you hoping to find uh, acceptance in that relationship? Are you hoping to find validation in a starting position on a team or maybe find validation through a promotion at work? Here's my question for you. When, not if, this world fails you, where will God provide you an opportunity to choose his contagious joy? Friends, our hope is in him. My prayer for you is that as we go through the series on joy, they would constantly ask yourself, where is this opportunity? You will find it in him and him alone. And where you find him, you find that joy. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this morning together, Lord, and I pray that uh, as unique and as delicate as each one of our circumstances are, God, that you would meet us in equally unique ways. God, you know uh, what we need and you know what we need before we even ask. God, give us the courage, give us the strength, Give us the eyes to see, the ears to hear when you are making joy available to us. In the midst of our challenges, in the midst of our struggles. In your name we pray. Amen.